uh, we will consider the pros and cons of these strategies and uh, we will discuss for sure uh, which are the main factors that uh, affect a firm's choice of strategy. Um, I will prefer that during my uh, lecturing um, to have um, an active participation uh, from, from the students. So I, I prefer uh, the, the question uh, to, be, to be done during my presentation. So I will ask you sometimes um, just to be more interactive and to make the, the lecture more more attractive so for all of us so feel free to ask me and to interrupt me uh, wherever you, you you want so um i decided to uh, start with uh, an opening case very interesting when we talk about um strategies of um, international business it's a uh, ford company um i'm sure that all of you are uh, are familiar it's it's okay you are are you yep. familiar with this company? Ford. Yeah. Okay. Ford. Mm -hmm. So um, yes. I will start from the beginning of uh, of the strategy. So um, when the CEO of um, of Ford, Alan Mulali, uh, arrived at, at the company in um, 2006 after a long career at uh, Boeing company, um, he was shocked to learn that the company produced one for Focus for uh, for Europe and uh, one for Focus for for the United States. And he said, um, "Can you imagine having one Boeing 737 for Europe and uh, one Boeing 3?" for uh, for the United States. So um, due to this um, product strategy, uh, Ford was unable to buy uh, common parts for, uh, for the vehicles and um, he couldn't share development costs and uh, he couldn't use its uh, European focus plans to make cars uh, for the United States or uh, vice versa. So uh, in a business where uh, economies of skills are important, uh, the result was high cost. So the strategy of designing and uh, building different cars for, for different regions was the standard approach at Ford. So uh, at the time, uh, Ford company was implementing and was focused on a localization a strategy. And this strategy uh, was based uh, on the assumption that customers that were located in different regions uh, had different tastes and preferences. So uh, this required considerable local customization. For example, we all know that Americans love um, big and large uh, cars. So they love uh, having their trucks, uh, while uh, European prefer smaller cars, uh, more uh, fuel uh, efficient cars. So uh, Alan Mulali uh, still couldn't understand why small cars uh, like the Focus, uh, which was sold in different regions, uh, were not built on the same platform uh, and didn't share uh, common parts. Uh, moreover, the strategy probably um, had more to do with the autonomy of different regions within Ford's uh, organization. So a fact that was deeply embedded in uh, Ford's history as one of the oldest multinational uh, corporation. Um, during the financial crisis um, around 2008, uh, 2009, uh, Mulali decided that uh, Ford had to change its long uh, standing practices uh, in order to get its costs under control. So uh, moreover, he felt that there was no way that Ford uh, would be able to compete uh, effectively in the large uh, development uh, market of China. So he decided to implement the so-called uh, One Ford strategy. I don't know if you heard about that, uh, that aims to create a handful mm -hmm of car platforms that Ford uh, can use uh, everywhere in the world. So under this strategy, uh, new models such as uh, 2013 Fiesta, uh, Focus and Escape share a common design. Uh, mm -hmm. They are built on a common platform and they use the same parts and are built in identical factories around the world. So he decided to adopt a global uh, international uh, strategy. So by uh, using this strategy, uh, Ford 
uh, have the possibility to share uh, the cost of design and tooling, and um, it can obtain much greater scale economies in the production of uh, component parts. So, uh, moreover, uh, since the different factories uh, producing these cars are identical uh, in all aspects, uh, useful knowledge acquired through experience in one factory uh, can quickly be transferred to other factories. And so this result in system-wide uh, cost savings, and it is very important for, for a company. So uh, what Ford hopes um, in the future is that this strategy uh, will bring down cost uh, sufficiently in order to uh, enable Ford to make greater profit margin in uh, developed markets and to make uh, good margin at, 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 uh, at lower price. But what is strategy? Um, I want to ask students if uh, uh, you can give me some uh, definition. Uh, what is strategy? What do we mean about uh, why we say um, a specific uh, firms must uh, um, pursue or implement uh, uh, a specific strategy? What is strategy? Uh, I believe yes, it's yes, that, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, but I think it's something you plan and try to make um, uh, achieved something. You, you make a plan and you are going to do something, to do something with that. Good, yeah. Other opinion? Thank you, Jessica. So, a firm strategy is defined as the action that managers take into account in order to obtain the goal of the firm. So, for most of the firm, uh, the goal is to maximize the value of the firm for its owners and its shareholders. So to maximize the value of a firm, uh, managers must uh, pursue strategies that increase the profitability of their enterprise and its rate of profit growth over time. Uh, so, in one side, we have profitability that is, decide, is, is defined as the rate of return that the firm makes on its invested capital, so growth. And this is calculated by dividing uh, the net profits of the firm by the total invested capital. And the other component is profit growth uh, that is measured by the percentage increase in net profits over time. So, uh, in general, we can say that higher profitability and higher rate of profit growth will increase the value of an enterprise and thus the returns generated by its owners, the, the shareholders. Managers uh, also can increase the profitability of the firm by pursuing uh, strategies uh, that lower costs or by pursuing strategies that add value to the firm's products. And these enable the firms to raise prices. And this is very important. So managers can increase the rate at which the firm's profits uh, grow over time by pursuing strategies uh, to sell more products in existing markets or by pursuing strategies to enter new markets. So expanding internationally uh, help managers uh, to boost the firm's profitability and increase the rate of profit growth uh, over time. Um, in order to uh, create, um, to increase the profitability uh, of a firm, um, we have to consider that the way to increase it uh, is to create more value. So, the amount of value that a firm creates is uh, measured by uh, the difference uh, between its cost of reduction and, uh, and the value that customers perceive in, uh, in its product. So, uh, in general, we can see that uh, the more value customers place on a firm's products, the higher the price the firm can charge for those products. So, 
Uh, however, the price a firm charges for a specific good or service is typically less than the value placed uh, on that good or service uh, by, by the customers. And this is um, because the customers usually capture uh, some of that value that uh, in the form of what uh, economists uh, call uh, uh, a customer uh, a surplus. Um, the firm's value creation um, usually is measured by, by the difference between uh, the value and, uh, and the cost, so B and C. So a company creates value by converting inputs uh, that cost C into a product on which customers place a value of V. So a company can create more value, so the difference V minus C, uh, either by lowering production costs uh, or by making the products more attractive uh, through superior design, uh, through, through styling, uh, through features, um, after sales service, uh, and so on. So that customers place a greater value on it and consequently are willing to pay a higher price for that product or, or service. So a firm has a profit when it creates uh, more value for, uh, for its customers and also at a lower cost. And this is very important. And we refer to a strategy uh, that focuses uh, primarily on lowering uh, production costs uh, as a low cost strategy. And we refer to a strategy uh, that focuses primarily on increasing the attractiveness of a specific product as a differentiation strategy. So according to Michael, uh, Michael Porter, uh, he argued that low cost and differentiation uh, strategy are two basic strategy for creating value and uh, obtaining a competitive advantage uh, in an industry. Um, why is strategic uh, positioning important? This is a very uh, important issue to discuss. Um, the figure um, illustrates his, his point. Um, if you see the convex curve, uh, is what economists uh, refer to as an efficiency frontier. So the efficiency frontier shows all the different positions that uh, a firm can adopt uh, with regard to adding value to the product and low cost, uh, assuming that its internal operation are configured efficiently uh, in order to support a particular position. So the efficiency frontier uh, has this um, uh, convex shape because of diminishing return. So diminishing returns imply that when a firm already has a significant value uh, built into its product offering, increasing value by a relatively small amount requires significant additional cost. Uh, moreover, the converse also holds uh, when a specific firm uh, already has a low cost structure. So it has to give up a lot of value in its product, offering to get uh, additional, uh, additional cost, uh, cost reduction. Uh, also, we can see um, uh, focusing on the, on the figure, uh, the figure plots three uh, hotel firms. Uh, so, industries, uh, firms that operate in hotel industries with a global present, uh, presence that cater to international travel. So, we have Four Seasons, uh, Marriott International and Star Woods. Um, for example, Four Seasons um, position itself um, as a luxury chain uh, and emphasize the value of its product offering. Uh, which drives uh, up its cost of operation. Uh, the other two uh, firms, uh, Marriott and Starwood, are positioned more in the middle of the market. Um, both of them uh, emphasize sufficient value to attract international business uh, travels, but are not luxury uh, chains like, like Four Seasons. Um, in the figure, Four Seasons and Marriott are shown to be uh, on the efficiency frontier and indicating that uh, their international operations are well configured to their strategy and run efficiently. Um, 
why do you think that Star Woods is inside the frontier? So why this positioning? How are Be running their, uh, its, its operation? Are running efficiently or not? What do you think about? And how are its costs? Okay, uh, Star Woods is uh, inside the frontier because its operation are not running efficiently comparing to the other two uh, hotels, let's say. And uh, also uh, this is according to its costs that are too high. Uh, and this implies that Star Woods is less profitable than uh, the other two and that its managers must take steps in order to improve the company's uh, performance. This is very, uh, very important. Um, another question or uh, another issue to discuss is how are a firm's operation uh, configured? Um, the operation of a firm, um, we, we can say that can be thought as a value chain that are composed uh, of a series of uh, distinct uh, activities uh, such as production, uh, marketing and sales, uh, materials management, R&D, uh, human resources, information system and firm infrastructures. Um, usually uh, the um, operations of a specific firms are categorized um, in order to uh, the creation of, uh, of, of value, um, they mostly are categorized into, um, into group, let's say primary activities in one side and uh, uh, support activities in, uh, in the other side. So uh, focusing on this figure, uh, the primary activities, uh, as we can see, have to do with the design uh, with the creation, with delivery of the product, its marketing and its support and after sale uh, service. So uh, the primary activities are divided into four functions, research and development, uh, production, marketing and sales and customer service. What is research and development? When we heard this, this term, this concept, what, what do you think about? Can you repeat the yes. questions? What is research and development as a part of primary activities? Uh, research, we need to research what you are going to do with the information we had uh, acquired uh, to do something. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Other opinion? So is it is a link it is concerned with the design of a product or production processes. So, I true we think that um, R and D is is associated with the with the design of a physical uh, product or a production process in manufacturing uh, enterprises. Many service companies also undertake R and D. Uh, for example, uh, online banking and smart debit cards are two examples of product development uh, in the banking industry. Um, earlier examples of innovation in the banking industry um, includes uh, uh, automatic teller machines, uh, credit cards or debit cards. So through superior product design, R&D can increase the functionality of products and this makes uh, them more attractive to, uh, to consumers. Uh, so R&D may result uh, in more efficient production processes and thereby cutting uh, production, uh, production costs. Uh, okay, um, another important uh, activity uh, is production. What is production? What do we mean about uh, production? Karina, for example, what is production? Production, I think, is the 
in the process to making another uh, product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So production is concerned with the creation of a specific good or service. So uh, for physical products, when we talk about production, we immediately think about manufacturing. So we can talk about the production for an, uh, an automobile. For uh, In the other side, we have uh, companies that operate in service sector, such as banking or healthcare. So production in this case uh, occurs when the service is delivered uh, to the customers. Uh, for example, um, is the case when a bank originates a loan for customers. And in this case, it is engaged in the production of the loan. Um, other example for retailers such as Walmart, production is concerned with um, uh, the selecting the mercantize, uh, stock in the store and so on. For the MTV, for example, that operate in service uh, industry, uh, production is uh, concerned with the creation, uh, with programming, uh, with uh, broadcasting, broadcasting of contact uh, such as music, video and, and so on. So uh, the production activity of a firm uh, creates a value by performing its activity efficiently so lower cost results or by performing them in such a way that a higher quality product is produced. Another important uh, activity is the marketing and sales function. Uh, through brand positioning and advertising, the market function can increase the value that customers perceive uh, to be uh, contained in a firm's product. If this creates a favorable impression of the firm's product in the minds of customers, uh, they increase the price that uh, can be charged for the firm's product. So marketing and sales can also create value by discovering customer needs and communicating them back to the R&D function of the company, uh, which can then design products that better match uh, those needs. Um, regarding the uh, support activities, the support activities um, of the value chain offer inputs that allow the primary activities to occur. So we have information system. What do you mean by information system? Why information systems are important? Can you link it with the pandemic situation? Uh, yes, I believe the information system is uh, we need to adapt to what we have. Like uh, the pandemic um, that we have um, caused many people to lost jobs and something like that and with the information we can now do the work from home yeah right? it's an example like yeah mm -hmm. so um when we refer to a specific firm a uh, specific enterprise uh we can say that uh, electronic system uh is useful for um information system is useful for managing inventory for example for uh, tracking sales, uh, for pricing product, for selling products, for uh, dealing with uh, with customers, service inquiries, and so on. So, uh, Dell, for example, um, has used its information system in order to um, to obtain a competitive advantage over other other competitors. Uh, another important um, activities is logistics. What do you mean by logistics? Have you heard about this concept, logistics? Um, yes. Yeah. I think it's um, when the, pro the product is distributed, yes. I guess. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think it's more about it, but I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a kind of function that controls the transmission of physical materials, so physical products through a value chain. So from procurement, through production, and into distribution. So this is the main um, function of, of the logistics. So uh, the efficiency um, with which this is carried out can significantly uh, reduce cost and thereby can uh, immediately create more value for a specific firm. And another important function um, is human resource. 
what is human resource? Why human resource uh, is important? The presence of human resource is very important in a specific industry, in a specific enterprise. Why we say that human resource can help firms in order to create more value? Yes. Um, because uh, it will deal with the, the workers' uh, interests, mm -hmm. like um, take care of their part, I guess. <laughs> okay, and, and more in particular is focused on skilled people, so skilled workers. So this function uh, ensures that the company has the right mix of skilled people to perform its value creation activities more efficiently. So the human resource function also ensures that people are trained, are motivated, are compensated to perform their uh, value creation task. And the final support activity is the company infrastructure. So the contents within which uh, all the other value creation activities occur. So the infrastructures include the organizational structure, control system, and culture uh, of the firm. Uh, another question that rises is how can firm increase profits through international uh, expansion? Um, usually we say that expanding globally, uh, this allow firms to uh, increase their profitability and rate of profit growth in ways not available to domestic enterprises. So firms that operate internationally are able to, first of all, ex expand the market for their domestic product uh, offering by selling those products in international markets, uh, realize lo location economies by dispersing individual value creation activities to those locations around the globe uh, where they can be performed most efficiently or effectively. Uh, third, they can realize greater e cost economies from experience um, um, affected by uh, serving and expanding uh, global markets uh, from a central location, so reducing the cost of value creation. And the last, uh, they have the possibility to earn a greater return by uh, leveraging uh, any valuable skills uh, developed in foreign operation and then transferring uh, to other entities uh, within uh, uh, the firm's uh, global uh, network of, uh, of operations. So um, starting with uh, the first uh, pos possibility uh, in order to leverage the products and competencies, uh, we can say that um, a specific firm, a specific enterprise, uh, can increase its growth rate by taking goods or services that are developed at home and selling them internationally. So um, when, uh, when we focus on in practice of, of, uh, of firms that operate internationally, uh, most of them started um, out doing just this. So for example, uh, Microsoft developed its software in the United States for selling it uh, in international markets. Um, or uh, automobile companies such as, for example, uh, Volkswagen and Toyota also grow by developing products at home by uh, then selling them in international markets. So uh, the success of many multinational companies um, that expand in, in, this, in, this, in this way is based uh, not just upon the goods or services that they sell in foreign nation, but also uh, basing on their core competencies uh, that underlie the development and marketing uh, of, of those goods or, or services. Uh, so, um, the, the, the term uh, core competencies uh, refers to, uh, to the skills uh, that are embedded in, in the firms that competitor, uh, competitors cannot easily match or, or imitate. And uh, these skills may exist in every of the firm's value uh, creation activities. So uh, production, in, in R&D, in human resource, uh, in logistics, in general management, and, and so on. So, uh, such skills are typically expressed uh, in uh, product offering, uh, 
uh, that that other firms uh, find difficult to match or imitate. Uh, for example, uh, Toyota has a core competence uh, in the production of cars. So it is able to uh, produce high quality, uh, well-designed cars at a lower delivery cost than the other firms uh, in the world. Uh, or another example, McDonald's has a core competence in managing fast food operation. Uh, second, why are location economies important? Uh, location economies are the economies that arise uh, from performing uh, value creation activities in, uh, in the optimal location for that activity. So wherever in the world might be um, the, the enterprise. So locating a value creation um, in the optimal location for that activity can have one of two effects. First of all, it can lower the cost of value creation and help the firm achieve a low cost position. And second, give the possibility to a firm in order to differentiate its product offering from those of, uh, of competitors. Um, Firms that uh, take advantage of uh, local economies uh, in different parts of, of the world uh, can create uh, a global web of uh, value web of, of, of the value creation activities. So a uh, different stage of the value chain are, uh, are dispersed to location where uh, perceived value is maximized or where uh, the cost of value uh, creation is, uh, is minimized. Another um, issue, another question to discuss is why are uh, experience effects uh, so important? Um, the figure you can see uh, refers, so the experience curve represented by the figure uh, refers to a systematic reduction in production costs that have been observed to occur over the life of, of the product. So um, there have been uh, many studies uh, that observed that uh, product, uh, the, man the man uh, manufacturing of a specific product uh, cost uh, declined by some quantity about each time cumulative output doubled. And we can see it through, um, through the figure. And the figure, uh, moreover, illustrates this experience curve relationship uh, between unit production costs and cumulative outputs. So in this case, we can say that two things explain this. First of all, learning effects, and the second, economies of scale. So in the other, in one side, we have learning effects that refer to cost savings that come from learning by doing, uh, and um, in the other side, we have economies of scale. So that refers uh, to the reduction in unit cost achieved by uh, producing a large volume of product. So attaining economies of scales uh, lowers a firm's unit cost and increases its uh, profitability. The last question, how can manager leverage subsidiary skills? Um, when we discuss the core um, competencies uh, of a specific firms. Uh, the idea is that valuable skills are developed uh, first at home and then for being transferred um, to foreign operations. So uh, however, the, um, for, for more mature uh, multinational that have already established a network of uh, subsidiary operation in foreign markets, uh, the development of valuable skills can, can just uh, as well occur in, uh, in foreign subsidiary. So skills uh, can be created anywhere uh, within a multinational global network operations. So wherever people have the opportunity and the incentive uh, to try new ways of doing things. So leveraging the skills creating, uh, created within subsidiaries and applying them to uh, other operation within the firm's global network may create value. And this is very important. Uh, moreover, um, for the managers of the multinational enterprise, this phenomena creates important new challenge. First of all, they must have the, hum the humility to recognize that valuable skills that lead to competencies can arise 
anywhere within the firm's global network. So not just at the corporate center. And second, they must establish an incentive system uh, that encourage uh, local employees to uh, acquire new skills. Uh, third, managers must, must have a process for identifying when valuable new skills have been created in that subsidiaries. And finally, uh, they need to act as a facilitator. And this is very important because uh, helping trust, um, transferring valuable skills uh, within, um, within a specific, uh, specific firm. Um, another issue to discuss is what types of competitive pressures uh, exist in the global marketplace. This is important, an important issue because uh, when firms um, compete in the global marketplace, uh, typically face two type of competitive pressures. So uh, that affect their ability to realize location economies and uh, experience effects and to leverage product and transfer competencies uh, and skills within the, the enterprise. Um, most of the firms that operate globally, uh, they face pressure for cost reduction and pressure uh, to be uh, locally responsive. So these competitive pressures uh, place conflicting demands on a firm. So responding to uh, pressures for cost reduction requires that a specific firm try to minimize its unit costs, uh, but uh, responding to pressures to be locally responsive requires that the firm differentiate its product offering so um, and, and, and a marketing strategy from country to country uh, in an effort to accommodate the diverse demand, demand arising from national differences in customers, tastes and preferences, uh, distribution channels, uh, competitive conditions and um, government policies and so on. So because differentiation uh, across countries can involve significant duplication and um, a lack of product standardization, it may raise costs. Um, while some enterprises um, that operate globally, uh, like for example, uh, in uh, as you can see from the figure, uh, a firm A uh, face high pressure for cost reduction and uh, low pressure for local responsiveness and others for example, such as uh, firm B face low pressure for cost reduction and high pressure for local responsiveness. Many companies are in the position of C. They face high pressure for both cost reduction and local responsiveness. In this case, uh, dealing with these conflicting and uh, contradictory pressures is a difficult strategic challenge primarily because uh, being locally uh, responsive tends to, to raise costs and they have to think about the preferences and the, the tastes of, of the domestic um, uh, customers. So customers that uh, refers to the, the, uh, the host country. Um, when are pressures for cost reduction greatest? Uh, this is a very important question. Uh, pressure for cost reduction can be uh, particularly intense uh, in industry, uh, industries that are producing um, typically a commodity type of, of products uh, where meaningful uh, differentiation uh, on non-price factor is difficult and price is the main competitive weapon. So this tends to be the case, for example, for products that serve universal needs. Um, have you heard about this term? What, what are universal needs? Um, there are needs that everyone or most people have, so they okay. tend to do something. But how, how are they comparing to different nations? So my they, preference compared to your preference for some specific products are different or are similar? Depends. Some are different, some are um, equal. Oh, for this, for these needs, when we say universal needs, so it means... I don't hear it similar. It's are similar. similar, yes, good. So this is the case uh, for uh, conventional commodity products such as 
for example, petroleum, uh, steel, uh, sugar, and, and so on. So uh, it also tends to be the case for many uh, industrial and customer products. Uh, for example, uh, semiconductor chips, uh, personal computers, uh, liquid crystal display screen, and so on. So pressure for cost reduction uh, are also um, intense in industries when major competitors are based in low-cost location and where um, there is a persistent excess capacity and where customers are powerful and face uh, low switching costs. So the liberalization of the world trade and invested environment in recent decades by facilitated greater international competition has generally uh, increased uh, the, cost, the cost pressure. Um, Another question, when, when are pressures for local responsiveness greatest? So pressure for local responsiveness arise from national differences in customer taste and preferences, uh, in infrastructure, um, in business practices and uh, distribution channels and from host government demand. So responding to pressures to be uh, locally responsive requires a firm to differentiate its product and marketing strategy from country to country in order to accommodate these factors. Uh, so all of which tends to raise the firm's cost uh, structures. So uh, another important question is which strategy should a firm choose? So we arrive at the end of the lecture, the most important part. Um, which are the, um, the strategy that a firm, a specific firms can choose in order to obtain a competitive advantage comparing to other competitors. So um, pressure for local responsiveness, um, we saw that it may not be possible uh, for a firm to realize the full benefits from economies of skill, um, learning effects and um, location economies. Uh, it may not be possible to serve the global marketplace for a single low cost uh, location, uh, producing a globally standardized product and marketing it worldwide uh, to uh, obtain the cost reduction associated with experience effects and the need to customize the product uh, offering to local condition may work against the implementation of such industry. So firms typically choose among four strategies uh, when competing internationally. And this can be categorized as a global standardization uh, strategy, a localization strategy, a transnational strategy, and an international uh, strategy. Okay. Um, the four strategies are represented in the main figure. Uh, we start with the global standardization strategy. What is global standardization strategy? Have you heard about that? Very probably, yes, but they are not as, uh, associating these okay. uh, subjects to a uh, curricular unit they had. It was, okay. uh, it is introduction, introduction to management. Okay. Uh, I guess that they are not associating the- No problem. The figure. No problem. No problem. Um, it's typically the, the strategy that Ford pursued initially. So mm -hmm. Ford started with this strategy. Uh, do you remember at uh, the beginning of the lecturing, um, I said uh, um, that the CEO of Ford, when initially started working um, at Ford Industry, he was shocked about the idea, the, the idea that uh, the Ford um, produced one Ford Focus for the Europe and one Ford Focus for, for the United States. So. Uh, the product was um, manufacturing according to uh, to tastes and preferences, let's say, of uh, of the host country. So, uh, okay, no problem. Um, what is global standardization a strategy? It focuses on increasing profitability and profit growth by reaping the cost reduction. Uh, that come from economies of scale. So, learning effects and location economies. Um, so the main um, activities 
the primary activities, in particular reproduction, marketing, R&D activities of firms, um, are uh, concentrated in a few favorable locations. So firm uh, pursuing a global standardization strategy uh, try not to customize their product offering and marketing strategy uh, to local uh, condition because customization involve um, shorter production um, and the duplication of functions. So these tend to raise costs, and this is very important. So instead, these firms that adopt um, global standardization strategy, uh, they prefer to market a standardized product uh, worldwide so that uh, they can reap the support aggressive pricing in uh, uh, in world market. So this strategy uh, makes more sense when uh, there are strong pressure uh, for cost reduction and demands uh, for local responsiveness are minimal. So increasingly, these conditions prevail in many industrial goods in industry. So whose products often serve uh, universal modes and uh, universal needs as uh, as we talk, uh, we, we discussed uh, initially. Okay, uh, what is the other important um, strategy? Uh, localization strategy. Localization strategy is focused on uh, increasing profitability uh, by, by customizing the firm's goods or services. Uh, so um, that they provide, let's say, a good match in, uh, according to the tastes and preferences in different national uh, markets. So as we saw um, in the Ford uh, case, so localization is most uh, appropriate when um, there are substantial differences uh, across nations uh, with regard to customer taste, customer taste and preferences and where um, uh, cost pressures are, are not too, uh, too intensive. So by customizing the product offering to uh, local demands, the firms have the possibility to uh, increase the value of that product in the local market. So uh, on the downside, because it involves some duplication of functions and um, smaller production runs, customization limits the ability of the firm to uh, capture the cost reductions that is associated with mass production, uh, uh, standardized uh, products for the global uh, consumption. So this strategy, uh, we can say that makes sense um, if the added value associated with local customization supports higher pricing. And this enable the firms to uh, recoup its, its higher costs, or uh, if it leads to a substantially greater local demand, enabling the firms in order to uh, reduce costs through uh, the attainment of uh, some skills economy in the local market. Uh, let's uh, go to the transnational strategy. The firms that pursue this strategy are trying to simultaneously um, achieve low cost through uh, location economies, um, economies of scale and learning effect. Um, they try to differentiate their product offering across uh, geographic markets to account for local differences. And um, as attractive um, as this may sound in theory, the strategy is not an easy, an easy one to pursue uh, since uh, because it places conflicting demands on the company. So differentiating the product in order to respond to local demands in different geographic markets raises costs and which runs counter to the, to the goal of reducing costs. The fourth strategy is- Sorry, one question. Um, yeah. The transnation you know, uh, strategy is like adapting the product to the customers. No, localization. No. Localization. No. Oh, okay. So in the localization strategy, you customize a specific product. So you build a specific product according to tastes and preferences of a specific uh, customer. Okay, thank you, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so the fourth strategy um, uh, is international strategy. Uh, sometimes it is possible to identify uh, multinational firms that 
uh, find themselves in the fortunate position, let's say, of being confronted with low cost pressure or uh, low cost uh, uh, pressure for local responsiveness. So many of these uh, enterprises have pursued uh, an international strategy, uh, taking products first produced for the domestic market and then selling them uh, internationally uh, with only minimal local customization. So the distinguishing feature of uh, many such firms is that they are selling a product that serves uh, universal needs, uh, but they do uh, do not face significant competitors comparing to other other firms that adopt other strategies. Uh, so, uh, unlike um, firms that pursue, for example, a global standardization strategy, uh, they are not confronted uh, with pressure to reduce their, their their cost structure, and this is very important. Uh, moreover, enterprises that uh, pursue an international strategy uh, have followed a similar development pattern um, as they uh, expanded into a foreign market. So they tend to uh, centralize uh, product development functions such as the R&D at home. But however, uh, they also tend to um, establish manufacturing and marketing function in its major uh, country or geographic region in which they, uh, they do business. So the result in the application um, can raise costs. And, uh, but this is less uh, of um, an issue if, if the firm uh, does not face, let's say, um, strong pressure for, for cost reduction. So I true they may undertake some uh, local uh, customization of product uh, offering and marketing strategy. This tends to be uh, rather limited in, uh, in scope. And uh, finally, we can say that in most of the firm that um, pursue an uh, international strategy, the head office retains fairly tight control over uh, marketing and uh, production strategy. And uh, the, last, uh, the last issue to discuss, very important, is uh, how does strategy evolve? Um, when we discuss the uh, of international strategy, um, we must consider that over time competitors um, inevitably emerge. So, and if managers in this case uh, do not take proactive steps to reduce their firm's cost structure, it will be rapidly outflanked by efficient global competitors. So, the message in the story is that. Um, an international strategy may not be viable in the long term. And for this reason, to survive, firms need to shift toward the global standardization uh, strategy or a transnational strategy in advance of competitors. So the same can be said about a localization strategy. So in this case, localization may, uh, may give a firm a competitive edge. So, but if if it is simultaneously facing aggressive competitors, the company will also have to reduce its cost structures. And the only way to do that uh, may be to shift uh, towards a transnational strategy. And this is, for example, the case of Procter & Gamble uh, that has been doing this. So uh, concluding as competition intensifies international and localization strategy, uh, tend to become less viable. And so managers uh, need to direct their companies toward um, either a globalization strategy or a transnational uh, strategy.